We have grown accustomed to the narrative, there's a mass shooting and we learned the perpetrator may have had a mental illness. People begin debating how the tragedy could have been averted and then partisanship flares around gun control and gun rights. But these horrific incidents are also sparking more dialogue about our country's mental health system. NMIF producer Megan Kamerick sat down with Jeffrey Swanson of Duke University, who was brought here by Ideas in Psychiatry at the University of New Mexico to talk about misconceptions around violence and mental illness. Professor Swanson, thank you for joining us here on New Mexico in Focus. You are here in New Mexico giving a lecture in several places. The title is The Truth About Gun Violence and Mental Illness. So what is the truth? Well, I think the truth uh, is relevant uh, by comparison to what is not true. Um, okay. <laughs> and uh, so, um, you know, I, I think what I'd like to do is to try to um, uh, counteract what are some common uh, myths and uh, misunderstandings about the relationship between gun violence and mental illness. Talk about those. What are these? Yeah. What are these myths that we all hold? Or many well, hold? you know, 60 percent of the adults in this country, according to national surveys, believe, for example, that people with schizophrenia are likely or very likely to be violent against other people. Um, and that's just wrong. Um, you know, it turns out that uh, studies of the uh, prevalence of uh, violent behavior in people with uh, schizophrenia and other serious mental illnesses as well show that the vast majority of people with mental illnesses do not engage in violent behavior. Uh, and most violent acts are committed by people who are not seriously mentally ill. So uh, it doesn't mean that it's not important. It mm -hmm. means we need to put it in perspective. Violence and mental illness are two separate, both important public health problems that intersect on their margins. That intersection is what gets lots of public attention, particularly when you have mass shootings. Yes, uh, because in those instances, that does seem to be a running thread, when it, particularly those incidents of violence. Yeah, it does. And whenever there is a, a, a horrible act of violence, like a mass casualty shooting by an individual who turns out to have a serious mental illness or some uh, you know, major uh, mental health problem, um, people leap to the assumption that, um, that this is somehow typical mm -hmm. and in fact mass shooters are very atypical both of people with mental illness most of whom are not violent and they're atypical of most uh, perpetrators of, of gun violence um, but that is the prism through which we end up looking at these problems um, it's a moment when the public is paying attention uh, and you know and I think that we need to seize that moment um, to try to uh, focus on problems of the mental health system while educating people about the fact that um, you know, mental health problems uh, really uh, are not that connected to, to, to violence. Well, you have written in several places that uh, tragedies like Sandy Hook or the shootings at Virginia Tech or in Denver and Tucson, there tends to be a rush to legislate immediately. Yeah. Why is that problematic? Well, it's problematic because um, the result can be, you know, what I've called crisis-driven law. Other people mm -hmm. have said the same thing. You know, an example is, uh, I think, the New York Safe Act uh, that was enacted in New York uh, shortly after the Sandy Hook shootings, this tragic uh, shooting where school children, some of their teachers were massacred. There's this public demand to do something about it. Um, so there were a bunch of provisions that seemed to make sense. Uh, let's beef up enforcement for um, you know people who traffic in gun uh, guns and 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 you know let's ban assault weapons and things like this. Uh, um, but then the the law reaches into mental health territory and says, well, why don't we uh, uh, have a mandate for mental health professionals and counselors and everyone if they have a client who indicates that they are having thoughts about harming themselves or, and there's a risk of, uh, of uh, harm against uh, self or others, that they have to be reported to the police to uh, match their names uh, against the gun registry database and to then be able to you know, remove guns from ostensibly dangerous people. Why but, is that problematic? Well, it's problematic because, um, you know, it could have a chilling effect on people's help seeking. If you know, imagine somebody on a college campus who, you know, cranks up their courage to go in and see a counselor and now their name is reported to the police. Well, it might keep them uh, from doing that. It could also inhibit what people disclose and tell their therapists. And mental health professionals have a lot of other options. Um, so, I, I, you know, it's just an example. And a, a, another one is in Connecticut, which changed their law now so that anybody who uh, voluntarily signs in to a psychiatric hospital uh, are, are put on the list of prohibited persons from firearms. Um, 
so what, what, I, what I'd like to do, though, is to um, talk about ways in which we could put that barrier between the dangerous person and the firearm mm -hmm. that are focused on real indicators of risk, not mental illness categorically as a broad, ca because the laws that we have now are probably over-inclusive. They get people who are not necessarily violent, but they also fail to identify some people who are. But there are other better approaches. Well, how do you gauge risk? Because uh, one of your articles mentioned that over half of the people who are psychotic and have killed strangers, which is a small percentage actually, over half of them had not sought mental health treatment or they weren't on antipsychotic drugs. We didn't know they were dangerous. Yeah. How do you gauge risk? Well, you risk for what? You know, I mean, well, so see, risk for violence. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So a lot of yeah. the, a lot of the literature on violence and mental illness uh, really is about everything from minor acts of violence, like pushing or shoving, um, all the way through more serious acts that couldn't in involve a weapon. Um, and you know, it seems after the fact that it's you know, these incidents should be predictable and preventable, looking mm -hmm. through the retrospectoscope, but they're <laughs> not necessarily the case. Uh, you know, there's, there's this hindsight bias. Um, so, you know, in advance... It's, we don't live in minority we, report land. No, even. and, you know, psychiatrists are notoriously bad at being able to predict who is going to be violent in the future. They're a little better at ruling out who's not going to be violent. Um, but um, the, the fact is, even if we cured serious mental illnesses, which would be wonderful, our problem of violence in society, you know, 96% of that would still be there. However, if you uh, bring into the definition of firearms violence, suicide, that's mm -hmm. a different story because um, that's over half of the, of the firearms fatalities in the United States every year are suicides. And that is much more related to mental health and it's related to preventable mental health conditions. Um, so, you know, if you, you, if we can't say on the one hand, well, it has, you know, gun violence has nothing to do with mental illness, and at the same time, recognize that we have a huge problem with, with suicides, and over half of the suicides use firearms, a little, mm -hmm. a little less than half. Um, so, you know, risk assessment um, is something that is very difficult to do. Uh, and, and so sometimes, you know, we have to think about, rather than just trying to identify that needle in the haystack of who is going to, you know, engage in violence. Um, we have to kind of think about, you know, the whole haystack, finding the haystack in the needle and preventing what we can't predict. If we were able to provide uh, better access to evidence-based mental health treatment to people, if we could think about violence as, almost as if it were a communicable disease, you know, in the community, how do we have healthier communities with fewer kids, you know, exposed to terrible trauma, growing up to be perpetrators. Um, so prevent violence. Uh, also do a better job of limiting access to guns and lethal means when people are at risk. And some of those are, you know. Uh, well, I was going to say, you're part of a consortium yeah. that um, of risk-based, uh, it was a risk-based firearms consortium, yes? Yeah, consortium of risk-based firearms policy. Okay. You yeah. recently made policy recommendations right. to states and the federal government. Yeah. Um, Right, so the Taking term... Taking some of this into account, so give us an idea of what those recommendations were. The term risk-based is not an accident, because we, we want the, fo the focus to be on, on risk. Um, we can't just legally, you know, uh, ban you know, access to guns in our country. It's a, well, it's a constitutionally protected right. So uh, trying to focus on um, what, when people are at risk. So one example on the mental health side would be this. Um, lots of people are involuntarily admitted to a mental health care facility on a short-term basis at a time when they do pose a risk. Um, many of them uh, don't end up getting a formal involuntary commitment as a judicial proceeding with a, a representation by counsel. So they're either uh, discharged or some of them actually uh, sign in voluntarily. Well, even though most mentally ill people are not dangerous, that is a time uh, surrounding that period of time when we do know that risk is elevated, risk of harming others or, or, uh, or self. So why not have a temporary a prohibition from firearms for people who come in to fall into that category um, and, and, and have it be paired with a policy for a timely uh, and clinically informed uh, and uh, a, a, a restoration of gun rights when people are no longer uh, at risk. Uh, 
So that would basically expand the, uh, the category of prohibited persons to include those people during that time and the, and, the, and the period after that when we know people are at risk. We also know there's evidence that um, there's a connection between risk of violence and things like uh, conviction for a violent misdemeanor. Mm -hmm. now, many people who have were convicted of, uh, of violent misdemeanors are not disqualified from guns um, under federal laws. In some states they are, California is an example, and there's evidence that that actually has reduced gun violence. So um, our recommendations would be, there's several categories of people on the uh, criminal side. Uh, violent misdemeanors would be one group who would be prohibited from firearms uh, for 10 years. Um, uh, how about prohibiting uh, guns from people with uh, two or more um, DUI or DWI convictions in five years, people who have been subjected oh to it. My goodness, you capture a lot of people in New Mexico with you that. You would, you know, I mean, that's <laughs> a little, you know, it's not yeah. without controversy. Mm -hmm. um, people have been subjected to a temporary domestic violence restraining order during the period of time that is in effect. And what about people who've had uh, two or more uh, convictions uh, for a crime involving a controlled substance? Now, those are things where we have evidence mm -hmm. that there, you know, it, whether it, that there's a connection between violence risk and those kinds of things. It would be easy to do because those records exist. Uh, those would be temporary provision uh, uh, restrictions. Um, but, but that's an example of the, of the kinds of policies that we're recommending. They're focused on, on, on risk. I want to ask you about a specific case here in New Mexico. I think you're talking about it in your lectures here. John Hyde, he was diagnosed as a schizophrenic, but he'd functioned pretty well for about 15 years. But then about 10 years ago, he shot and killed five people. Now, he and his family had actively sought help. Yeah. And they were told by authorities they had to wait until he escalated. Well, he, he escalated. Right. So I'm curious if you're mentioning this in your talks here, what could have been done differently here? And is there anything now in place that would prevent another case like this? Well, it's, you know, it's hard to say. Um, I mean, the, the case of John Hyde is, is so tragic on a number of levels. It's a personal tragedy, a family tragedy for the people who lost their lives. Uh, again, it's easy to, after the fact, look back at what happened and say some things, you know, there were opportunities maybe uh, where uh, he could have been detained, involuntarily committed. Um, you know, I, I think it, it's an occasion where we can recognize a fact, and that is that the, the behavioral health care system, not in just this state, but in many states throughout this country, um, is, is, is seriously uh, inadequate. It's fragmented, where there's not a lot of um, communication and connection between different sectors like the inpatient sector and emergency psychiatry and outpatient treatment. It's um, under-resourced, so there's more need than, uh, than we have the capacity to meet. Do you think there's political will to change that? Well, I don't know. Um, I think there should be because um, we're, we're, we're never going to solve the problem by just simply, um, you know, kind of rearranging things in the system uh, without investing in, um, you know, more uh, capacity to provide the evidence-based treatments uh, that, that are, are available. Um, I also think that the Hyde case is interesting because if you remember this, one of the things that was proposed as a solution is let's pass a law uh, for outpatient commitment, you know, mandated community treatment. Let's pass a law that would, you know, apply to certain people and say that we're going to give them a court order so that they have to participate in, in outpatient treatment. It didn't pass. One of the reasons was that the critics of it, I think rightly so, pointed out that there wasn't, along with that, a proposal for an appropriation of funds in the system to provide more services. So if you just say, well, you know, we've got an inadequate mental health care system. Let's pass a law that requires people to, you know, go get the crummy services to which they don't have access anyway. I mean, you know, maybe that's not a very good solution. But, but it was, it's an example. There are three laws in this country, outpatient commitment laws, that are named for, after people. The, for people who were mm -hmm. killed by an individual with mental illness. Uh, Kendra's law in New York, and Kendra was pushed in front of a subway mm -hmm. train, and, and, and uh, Kevin's law in Michigan, and Laura's law in California. And it's a really important question to ask, would those laws have actually uh, saved those lives? It, it, it isn't a doubt in my mind that, that the laws would not have been enacted without those uh, you know, tragic incidents, but um, outpatient commitment is a policy that maybe applies to a small group of people, mm -hmm. Um, 
uh, but arguably, um, you know, it, it, the, the way to, 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 the, to fix the system is not just to uh, pass a law uh, mandating people to services, but to invest in services that are going to overcome some of the barriers to care uh, that we have. I, um, you anticipated my last question. It's very quick, and I apologize because I know these are complex. If you were omnipotent and had a magic wand, what would you do? Tell me in like 30 seconds. <laughs> and we'll continue this conversation on the web. Yeah. But. It's not a one or a two or three thing problem, so we need to do more than one thing. But that's I, the problem. People yeah. approach it as a one they do. silver bullet. People say, oh, that's what's a bad the one of words, what's yes, the, yeah, you know. Well, you know, What's the one thing? And you, you know, can't change the Second Amendment of the Constitution mm -hmm. if you wanted to. So, you know, I think. Um, enacting some of these policy recommendations would be one good thing. That's not enough. We mm -hmm. certainly need to think about violence as a public health problem and get upstream and invest in healthier communities. And that means starting with kids who are exposed to trauma. Uh, and that means providing uh, treatment for drug abuse for people who need that. Maybe spend more of the money on that than on mm -hmm. interdiction. Um, and it, and, it, and it also means, um, you know, trying to, uh, you know, follow people up and not, not just thinking, well, you know, this is kind of a, uh, a, a one, one shot again uh, mm -hmm. thing. And I, I think if we did all of these things, um, we're going to have incremental changes. You know, we live in a society where guns are a radioactive political symbol. Um, but mental health is maybe the one square inch of common real estate where people who disagree on gun control can come together and think about uh, you know, at least that part of it. And uh, suicide prevention is a good example. That is a great public health opportunity. Uh, it's a, those are treatable illnesses that uh, increase suicide risk. And limiting access to lethal means when people are uh, uh, you know, at risk would be, a, would be a great thing to do. Well, Dr. Swanson, thank you so much for coming on and talking about this very complicated issue. Thank you and very much around. for having we'll me. Do some more on the web. So. Great.